Record on this computer. All right. We'll wait for a few more minutes. So we'll wait for a minute or two for people to get in since, of course, it's not it's not time yet. Let me just go ahead and pull up some stuff. Runestone. Arthur. I was like, where in the world am I going to get more Monte Carlo problems? And they remember, wait a second. I had one for a quiz I wrote a million and a half years ago for a different semester. Okay. So uh, assignments go all the way down to quiz six problems. Lucky piles, that's what it was. All right, so before I forget this, most of the, a lot of the scam games I got came from How to Cheat at Everything by, si uh, by Simon Lovell. So um, that's where most of my uh, scams came from. Hold on a second. Two factor authentication. So first, you'll have gotten a, let's go over this, okay, announcements. I'll send out, I, I'll send out an announcement about the final exam, uh, when that is, I believe we discussed it was Thursday, right? Right, this upcoming Thursday? Not today, obviously, that would be a bit <laughs> Be a bit tricky since I still have to, you know, finish writing the darn final exam. Um, but um, I'll also send I'll also send out a copy of all the rules to everybody to make sure that everybody understands it was the same as the previous semesters. The only difference is that for the first five problems, those are the kind of problems that. So the only difference for our exam is that the five short problems are the find they're they're generally the kind of problems that you would be able to answer if you ran the code. So for those, you just don't get to use idle, and we'll just simply be enforcing that by again walking around and checking and you know uh, just handling that way. Now with regards to other announcements, you should have seen an announcement about a post survey. Um, Please fill that out if you if you have the opportunity that um, it is a it, it this this is part of a research project I'm attached to so it would give me uh, it'd be very helpful if you did were able to fill out this survey I know you're probably being asked to fill out a million and a half surveys because everybody is asking their students questions post COVID and during COVID and stuff so. Um, but if you could fill that out, that'd be a great uh, help. Yes, there's lab on Friday and Monday. There's still labs, um, which, you know, might be useful if you need to, uh, you know, meet, you know, with your group members or work on something or get something demoed at the last minute, you know, those kind of things. So there's still a lab, so there's a, still a lab session um, for, uh, for this. So, Okay. So let's see. So that's what, so we went out, we left, uh, and then again, your final project is due Monday, 11.59, you know, end of the day. Um, again, turn in what you have. We, we went through this on, on, on Tuesday. You want to turn in what you have for the final exam. Otherwise it's going to be a uh, very, Otherwise, I, sorry for the final project. Otherwise, I won't be able to grade it. Um, again, I will try to get that final uh, those final projects graded all Tuesday. Just basically, I plan on spending all that study day uh, going through the final uh, final projects so that I can uh, 
go and send out, okay, yeah, these people got the best final project. Um, because the other, because you want to know whether or not you have to study. I'm sure. So we, but regardless, we'll finish, we'll do our studying here. So before we move on back to our, um, to what we were working on yes on Tuesday, let's plan on taking a look at one of the Monte Carlo problems that I had written a while ago. Okay. And let's go ahead. Um, read some files. Okay, that's fine. I don't care about mixed new lines. All right. So now what we've got to do is we'll take a look at this question over here. So this one is another uh, problem I came up, you know, I adapted. And this one is, uh, was part of a quiz that I gave out, um, not this semester, but a number of semesters ago. So I suggest we play a betting game. We're going to take a deck of cards and, and shuffle it and then cut it into three piles at random. Got it? Three piles at random. I then bet that one of the that a royal card will be, be on at least one of the top one on the top of one of those three piles. If one of those cards is at the top, then I win. If uh, one of those cards, if, if none of the cards have a royal card on it, then you win. So, and and of course, I'm going to helpfully explain that there are. Uh, 12 royal cards in a standard 52 card deck, right? There's jack, king, and queen. There's three different types, and then there's four suits. Three times four is 12. This is not the lie here, right? So that's 12 cards, winning cards versus 40 losing cards. So the uh, odds are obviously in your favor. That there's the lie because um, what are the real odds to calculate them using a Monte Carlo simulation? All right. So what we've got here again is a deck of cards. We are going to split up that deck of cards and then reveal the top card of each of those um, decks. Right. And there's a lot of different ways to do this, but the let's go through the rubric shuffling the deck, taking a shuffle deck and splitting it to three piles. These piles can be any size, but must have at least one card. Right. If we didn't have one card, we can't check what the top is. Um, Sucking the top card from each of the piles, determining who won, doing it 100,000 times, adapting the real odds. All right. So for this one, let's go ahead and take a look. And I gave some starting code for myself, um, for the students rather, so that we could, um, you know, have, you know, so this would work. So here we go. All right, so here is, so first I've created, so I'm gonna start out with a, with a function called create shuffled deck. Okay, here we, it's an incomplete function on that I provided, just simply so you wouldn't have to think about how to start, how to make a deck of cards, right? So here, what I did is I just simply took the, um, is I simply took, the all the values of the cards two through ten and then jack king queen and ace and then multiplied it by four which basically makes takes that list and replicates it four times so if i print this right we get a 52 card deck and we can actually check that by saying len of this. Okay. 52, and that gives us 52 cards, right? So next, what we'll want to do is shuffle this. So we'll go over here and I'll import random. Okay. And then random dot shuffle. Um, 
and then we'll say, I want to shuffle this. And then when we return it, well, it's going to say 52 because I didn't delete the length function, right? And we run this. And it, there we go. It's that easy to shuffle, to basically create a shuffled deck of things, right? So we have, let's see, we have a queen, a three and a two, all these things. So now what we need to do is our next step is we want to figure out how to def create piles, right? The entire point of this exercise is that we're going to take in a deck of cards and we need to split it up into three piles. Now, there's a couple of ways we can do this. The first is just the cheating at statistics way, which is um, the shortcut way. And we'll check that one out later, which is just simply saying that, um, and this is the cheating at statistics way. So we're splitting up, uh, them up to the random piles. Um, deck, zero. File two is equal to deck one and pile three is equal to deck two to the end. So I split everything up into a pile of one card, one card, and 50 cards, which statistically ends up because we only care about the top card that statistically ends up being the same thing. Uh, and we'll we'll take a look at that later for kind of just simply, uh, for simply verifying that. Not prove it, but verify that, th that, it, that it ends up being the same thing. But what if I actually wanted to do, you know, something else? Um, well, in that case, what I'd wanna make sure I did is that um, I'd use, what if I actually wanted to physically split these up randomly, you know, actually mimic it. I have to choose two random numbers, right? I have to choose two random numbers and they, they can't be zero. So the random number can't be zero because, uh, uh, well, rather, let me put it this way. I'm trying to split up this, this, this thing, choose two indexes and say, okay, the first split starts here. So if I chose four, as got if the number four got chosen randomly, I'd say zero, one, two, three, those are pile one, and then pile two starts at index four. Make sense? Yes, no, no, okay. And then after that, if pile eight was, if sorry, if index eight was chosen to be the start of, uh, of pile two, I'd wanna go four, five, six, seven, and then start that at the jack. So how do we split it up? Well, we'd have to choose some random numbers, specifically a random int. And we'd want to be a bit careful about how we chose it. Um, but at the end of the day, it's if it was one, if we were splitting up into two piles, it's no problem. We would just simply say, okay, uh, random dot rand int, um, or rather pile to start. We'd say random dot rand int is starts at either from any any random index from one, and then this has, and then we'd say we'd say fifty because you because pile pile three, so I'd say one to fifty. Why? because we don't want our first pile, our second pile to start here because otherwise our first pile wouldn't have any cards, right? So if pile two starts here, the pile one would be out of bounds, essentially starting there, make sense? And then if we chose 50, and then here I'm doing 50. So this is index 50. If we've chosen index 51, there'd be nothing for pile three, okay? So really, actually, we can do this with just choosing one number. Um, what we would do is that I'd say that pile one, let's see if we can do this with one number. Pile one is equal to deck dot, and we're just splitting here, 
we're going to do from pile to now we we need two two numbers zero to pile to start so that will go up to but not include that index pile two is going to be equal to deck and it's going to start at pile two start obviously and it's going to go up to but not include some other index okay so question mark there and then pile three will go we'll go we'll start at that aforementioned index and go up to and include the rest of it so how do i start so in other words how do i choose this this other one this other variable which will be which we'll just call pile three start right yes like that's a way to do that i was just gonna say uh i i was gonna do it a bit differently but you could do it i think just using subtraction i, I i'm gonna be a bit more direct and less math involved though if that makes sense so pile three start all right, let me go ahead and copy paste. And this is why, you know, working on a computer sometimes takes longer than you'd expect because you got to do copy paste and then you mistype and then you have to click around. And anyway, so here, rather than choosing a number over here, we've chosen our first number. And our second number, we're going to say is going to be pile to start plus one, why plus one? Because we wanna make sure we have a index for it to start at. And then 51. Because we could start, because we can start our, uh, our third pile at the very last point. So for instance, if pile two is, is again four, we'd uh, which means it starts at the queen, then pile three can start at the seven at earliest. Make sense? So now all I have to do is I'm going to return pile one, pile two, and again, pile three. So we're gonna just simply um, so return those. Def play game okay so first thing we need to do to play this game is we need to we say deck is equal to create shuffle deck we say that um and then we're going to create piles and There we go, create piles. And we'll say pile one, I'll just call them P1, P2, P3 over here, which helps them be nice and, oh, I can, I can afford to type in the rest, the, the extra three letters for each. Okay. So what we did over here is that we copy, we copied those three. And now, so, so we, we've got those things. And now we have to ask ourselves, um, how, how do we make sure we, we win? Um, so we have a class of character. We have a class called, um, we, have a cert, we have some cards called royals. And I'll just use a string here because king, jack, or queen are our royals. Technically, there we go. There were queen, queen, jack. And now we can ask if pile one, if the top of that, right? So how does this game get played again? To refresh your memory, split up into three piles, check the top card of each. If none of them are royals, we win. Otherwise we lose. So if pile one is equal to a, so we can either check if we're winning or losing. 
doesn't matter which one. Do we want to check if we won or do we want to check if we lost? It's going to be equally long. Check if we won. Okay. So to check if we won, we say if pile one not in royals. So in other words, if the top of the card isn't in royals and not or, but and here because we're checking all conditions here. If it's not in the royals, And right, and now I've just copy pasted. And you know, make sure that when you copy paste something to do that. So if pile one not in royals and pile two not in royals and pile three not in royals. So if none of those, if the not if none of the heads of the cards are in the yes. Yeah. I was just testing you, obviously. Very good. Thank you for catching that. Um, I I totally uh, I totally forgot to put uh, to feed deck in there um, for that. It's one of those that you know, and this happens a lot. Um, but yes, we had to feed in deck as a deck a deck into the function. Forgot to feed the the you know the thing I created in there. So we've checked those things, and now. If that is all true, if if those are all true, we won, return true. If nothing is in the royals, else uh, we lost, return false. So now we can simulate this. Okay, now we simulate this and we simulate this by saying, um, we'll do trials. We want to do 100,000 of them as we typically do because that seems nice and statistically significant. We do this for in range trials, okay? What are we gonna do? We are gonna, we're, this is just gonna be standard counting how many times we've won. Wins is equal to zero. Wins plus equals one. If we want to do that, if play game, I'll be happy to scroll back up um, if you need if you need me to. Um, if play game is true, wins plus equals zero. Uh, print, and what we'll do over here is print wins divided by trials. Okay. Okay. And let's just make you see, and then we'll see. And our victory chances are about 44%, which is, I guess, not too bad considering uh, the, the games that I normally subject you to. Um, so let's look at why. Why is this the case? Um, so effectively what we're, what this comes down, this is, so the whole splitting up into files, this is effectively a roundabout way of saying, let's choose three cards at random from the deck. And if none of them are a Royal card, then, uh, then you win three cards at random from the deck. So there's, so using some basic calculator stuff, there's 12 out of 52 cards are royal. That's the chance of you drawing your first card. Then chance of you drawing your second card are 12 out of 51. Chances of you drawing a third card and it not being a royal is 12 out of 50. Which that is the, doesn't seem quite right. Let's see. Where did I go wrong in that math? 12 out of 52 cards, right? We draw our first card. It's not a royal. And that is the chance that, it, that's okay. That's the chance that that is that single card is a royal. 
chance that um that this card the second card isn't a royal and chance the third card isn't a royal so i messed up the math somewhere right right she is something that's not a royal 42 out of yes of course that was the chance that i'm not sure what i was calculating there oh the chance that i wouldn't i was calculating the chance that i i was calculating the wrong thing the chance that i wouldn't draw that i wouldn't draw that the only things i would draw were face cards i it's been a very a long couple of days i apologize for this i have not gone to sleep uh I, I've been up working until about 11.30 every day for the past uh, week. I apologize for that. Um, and then 42, and then 39, 38 out of 50. And of course, put in parentheses because we care about our order of operation because uh, I never like to leave our order of operation up to ambiguity. Um, so 44.7 versus our 44.6 or 44.9%, that seems about, about fair. So it's the chance of drawing, of, of drawing those three things. Again, what we could do over here is that, um, again, we see this when I, when I comment those out and I just simply say my, I go back to my original uh, solution. Let's see. Okay, what happened there? Um, if pile zero not M royals and pile one not M royals. Oh, because that was a list of lit. Okay, there we go. So we go back and we see it's, it's statistically the same as if I just simply chose the first three cards uh, out of the deck. Um, this one again isn't gonna make you money if you're scamming people. Although if it's a if you're a casino, you definitely want to play this game because it's got that kind of incremental win that you that you're really fond of. Um, the most game, I mean, the way most casinos make money is the fact that the games are not, are they are, they are rigged against the player and in the favor of the house, just slightly, the odds are slightly in the favor of the house. Okay. But not enough that you can't, that players can't get the occasional big win. Right. But you only have to make incremental wins to win a, to, for a casino. Um, there's really only one game where the player has the advantage, in, and I think we've discussed this before. What's the game that the player has an advantage in the casino? Anyone? Blackjack. Blackjack is the only game where the player has the advantage. If you play, if you memorize perfect play, then I think it, the odds are slightly in your favor, just maybe a tad or not terrible. But once you introduce the concept of card counting, then things swing wildly in your favor because you're no longer doing things randomly. You're betting when it's most advantageous for you to bet heavily. Card counting isn't particularly complicated either. It just requires a lot of practice and not being distracted. It's also not illegal, but of course, if you're caught, you can be very you can be asked to, to leave a casino, both very politely and very forcefully, um, because they have their business. They have the right to not. Um, you know, to not do that. Plus, of course, games like, you know, Texas Hold'em and the like, where you're playing against other players rather than the dealer, those deal, while that statistics do come into play, what comes into play even more is the ability of a person to bluff as well as keep their, as, and keep their tells, you know, rather down. It all comes down. Uh, long story short, if you're going to gamble, never gamble with more than you can literally afford to lose. You, if you're going to gamble, you have to assume that you're going to lose everything. Um, so even, even shorter story though, don't gamble. Um, so, but the blackjack is a very, you know, it's a kind of at a level, uh, a level where you can kind of simulate how that game works. It's a good programming exercise to simulate that one because there's a lot of moving parts. 
poker is a bit harder because you've got all of these conditions that you have to check that that click. You know, what makes a two of a car, well, you know, what makes a two pair versus a flush? And it helps that you can go through those things sequentially. Um, as you can tell, I'm a bit of a fan of this one. Um, right. So let's go ahead and see some other ones. Um, so I had the sent out an announcement with some practice problems. If I drag up some more, I'll be able to, if I can drag some more up tonight, I'll send them out. Um, but also you can feel free to go. What I would also do is that I would go to previous semesters. If you feel like you need more problems, Go over here to lecture recordings. Scroll down to all these previous semesters where I've done the class and still have them up. And you can go and look at the final reviews for all those lectures. While a lot of the stuff may have changed, they're all stuff that you should be able to still do. You know, they're they're all within your um within your uh capability, even though they're not necessarily things I'll do anymore. Okay. So is palindrome, I think, um, so we're going to start with is palindrome, even though that's one that in that I, that I took from Java and I kind of like, was like, oh, this is too easy last, you know, last lecture. And it is too easy. Okay. Um, for, for a final exam. But not if it's in Java. In Python, where you've got the ability to do so many cool little things in Python, it's really cool. It's it's really it's really easy. So first off, let's talk about what a palindrome is. A palindrome is one of those words that can be that spelled the same as it is forward and backwards. So radar, classic palindrome over there. You know, uh, also representing the R words are race car. You know, those are, um, and not to be outdone, my personal favorite, Taco Cat. Um, those, are, those are all palindromes. Um, and I am mildly miffed that palindrome is not itself a palindrome. You know, like we could have chosen a better word to describe it that was also a palindrome, but hey, whatever. That's language for you. Um, some palindrome. Now, now actually this can get better because also there's palindromic phrases. So if you want to take this to the next level, we might do that. Um, but like um, a very famous one is a, is, uh, let's see, a man, a plan, a canal, Panama. There's a bunch listed in here in, in all in different languages. Um, all sorts of different, uh, Things. But let's go ahead and uh, and take a look at this rather than talking about palindromes. Okay, so in the easy ones. Uh, so what we want to do is check is it the same spelled forward and back. Given that this is a string, we can do that with one with you know one line. Return word double equals word, and then use slice notation to create an exact duplicate of it, but in reverse. That is a one-line solution to that puzzle, to that problem. Now, in Java, you typically would have to go through and reconstruct this, right? So let's go ahead and just do, do that manually just for the sake of practice, right? For in range, for I am range, uh, let's see. Or actually, no, let's just go for letter in word. We'll go ahead and create a reversed. Oh, hey, there's a reversed function as well built into, into Python. I always forget about it. So I'll just call it reverse. Empty string. Four letter in reverse. What we'll do, and to reverse, uh, you know, we've, we've learned how to concatenate stuff one at a time, right? If I were to do this, reverse is e plus equals letter, I just end up with the same thing, right? I just end up with the same thing. And we just simply be re doing return reverse equals word. There's no need for a, uh, there's no need for us to do an if else statement. We can just simply 
return the result of, a, of this Boolean comparison directly. But this would just simply make reverse an exact duplicate. Like if I was testing this against, again, what's not a palindrome, wolf, but a, you know, versus flow, those are while two valid words are not palindromes, right? Wolf and wolf and flow are not palindromes of each other. They're that's they're they're reversing, and you don't, you know, they're just. And this, if I put in wolf as my word, what I have right now will give me wolf and not flow. So while what I have would would pass on radar, pass on race car, pass on taco cat, it would fail on wolf because why? It, it would not. Be, give me the correct answer. So in order to do it in reverse, instead of doing, well, let's think about what this is. Reverse plus equals is reverse plus letter. And here we're adding in the letter at the end. And rather than concatting the letter at the end, we're just gonna simply put it at the beginning. And that would help us reverse that. There's a lot of ways to do this one, but honestly, that one is probably the, Easy, you know, the easiest. Now, here's the question, though. And the reason I did this is, what if it's not word? What if it's text? And I want to check if it's a palindrome. Man, a plan, a canal, Panama which if you take, if you ignore all punctuation spaces, it's a palindrome. So how would we uh, just, so now, now, now we're out of the, out of doing a one-liner, right? So how would we get this to work on this? And the answer is we'd want to make sure that we ignored anything that wasn't text. Now, this is kind of a case for regular expressions. I'm sure you could like come up with an a, with a regular expression to make sure that that for each letter, make sure it's one, you know, in the character class. But honestly, we've got something built into strings. So let's go ahead and look it up. Python string. Doc. And I again I'm gonna look it up because I forget what the, all you know what all these things are. So, you know, feel free to print these out, save these, whatever you have. String has a bunch of really useful things. ASCII lowercase, there we go. That's what we need. The lowercase letters, all these things, right? I mean, we could just simply spell them out and just simply say, so I could just, you know, do this. You know, I could just simply say uh, something like this. If letter in, so what we're going to do it like this is, is is test them both out. So we're going to build it in forward and reverse at the same time, but without the um, without the uh, spaces or the punctuation in. So for letter, so if for every letter, if the letter is in, and then there's nothing nothing stopping me from you know manually typing everything out which would take you maybe like 30 seconds, but as the downside of being uh, yeah, that, you know, human error could enter into effect, you know, uh, you could in the, uh, you know, for want of a better term, fat finger it, you know, accidentally hit two keys at once while going through it and miss it. But regardless, we would then do, forward is equal to forward plus letter and reverse is equal to reverse plus letter. And then you just check if forward and reverse are the same, right? Because we can't check this anymore since we're getting rid of this. We're only caring about the letters. Um, we could also do, I believe string string, and then I believe this works. And now I'm gonna have to double check. Just putting in the empty string, so that you have access to all the string methods. This is a really weird way to do that rather than importing string, but hey, it's hacky and it works. Yes. Like you would replace case and put like 
Yeah, but then you'd have to go through all of those characters, you know? You could totally use the replace function, though, to replace them with empty strings. You could. It's a valid technique. I, 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 I'd allow it. So let's go ahead and check is palindrome print. So we're going to test it on a couple of these. And there's a, you see, I knew there was a reason I kept it around. Radar. String object has no attribute lowercase. So if, what do I have to say? Oh, I bet you have to maybe say string. Do I have to import string in order to do this? I bet you I do. Okay, yeah. I have to import the string library, which has a bunch of these functions, and then say string lowercase. But, you know, there's a bunch. And then if we pump in this, true. And if I pump in wolf, I should hopefully get false. Because you can't just te test your trues. You have to test your, you have to test things that will you know will fail as well. It's it's really counterintuitive to our human's mind because we want things to work to also feed things in that would br obviously break it. But that's the way that things in science work. You have to you have to try to falsify your hypotheses a lot of the time. You know, try to disprove it. It's actually an exceptionally important part of science that I don't know. And I haven't, you know, checked in with the general science studies that you go through in public education these days. But at least when I went through through uh, middle school, falsification was not a big part of the whole scientific process that they taught. You know, the scientific method steps. All right, this is something that I asked. So this one's actually homework two in my. Um, in my, this is part of homework two of my data structures class because it is a, not this one, this one over here. Given two strings, write a method that returns true if they are permutations of each other. They're permutations of each other if they have the same numbers of each characters. Use a pair of dictionaries uh, to do this. This is a much harder problem than would be than would appear on the exam. Now, here's the thing. This is the reason I say this. Uh, I tell you to use two dictionaries. If you don't use two dictionaries, it's just a mess. It is some of the most convoluted code you will see because you have to iterate over the same thing you're iterating over in order to fully do things. Um, so to be clear, wolf and flow, okay. So let's, but I figure, hey, we should go over, over it in general. Uh, wolf and flow, are permutations of each other, okay? So wolf and flow are permutations. Um, but here's the thing, if I did wolf and flow, these would not be permutations of each other because we'd have one more F and, and then over over here, it's easier if I show you with some abstract examples. Unfortunately, um, A B C, B C A, those are those are permutations of each other. A A, B B, C C versus C A B cab cab. Okay, those are permutations of each other. But here's the thing: this is what are not permutations of each other. A A B uh, B C C and C, A, B, B, A, B. These are not permutations of each other because we have three A's in here and three B's in here, okay? They have different matching. Now, there are a couple ways that you can go. There's a bunch of ways we can do, we can do this. And in fact, there's actually literally, well, when I say bunch, I mean, there's three primary approaches. Approach number one, blaze through without uh, with, with four loops. Very straightforward way to do it. It's painful, but straightforward. Um, we will take a look at that. Step two, 
um, is to be a bit pithy about it, um, sorted, which is that, well, any permutation that we take, if we sort it, they'll end up in the same kind of orientation. And you can kind of check this, but again, the one liner for this would be return sorted, um, you know, sorted of word one equal equals sorted of word two. This comes up with two things, you know, two, and if they're identical, great, they're permutations. If they're not identical, they're not permutations. Hence why, why I specify to use permutation, you know, use dictionaries to do that. Let's go ahead and, and say though that I'm not gonna use dictionaries and I just wanna blaze forward. Well, what I would do is I would say, um, the first thing I would wanna check is if they are the same length. In fact, I'm gonna do that regardless of what I'm do of the approach I'm taking. If word one, if length of word one is not equal to the length of word two, then there's no way they're permutations of each other. They can't possibly have the same counts of the same characters because they have completely different numbers of characters, right? Make sense? So, so return false. I'm gonna also assume that, uh, I'm gonna assume that everything's a permutation by the way, until, because it's easy to prove that it's, it's easier to prove that it's not. So if I'm not using uh, dictionaries, then what am I gonna do? I'm gonna say four letter in, word uh, in word one. And this is where it's gonna get a bit messy. Um, so count, okay. So over here, I'm gonna comment these out temporarily. Count, count one is equal to zero. So that's how many, count one is gonna represent how many times this letter appears in, in, the, in word one. Count two is going to is going to be how many times this appears in words two. Are there is there a function that will make this easy for me? Yes. Am I going to use it? No, because um, because if you do you know because this is just demonstration purposes for L one in word one. So for a letter in word one for each letter in here we're going to look at every letter in word one. So notice that I've got the same loop going on inside its own loop. Uh, if L1 equal equals letter, count one plus equals one. Right, so I'm gonna check every letter in word one. If, it's, if that's the letter I was looking for, if that's the letter in word one, great. Then I'll say for letter two in word two, for each of those letters in word two, word two do the same thing, but switch those all to twos. And if that, so I'm gonna look at each letter, count how many times it appears in word one, how many times it appears in word two. If they have different counts, then they can't be the same letter. This is actually a lot more concise than it looks in Java. It's horribly, uh, the, all those curly braces make it look terrible in Java. So that works for that one if you're not going to use dictionaries. But let's be smart about this and use dictionaries now. Okay. So to check if two things are permutated. Also, um, doing it this way is actually quicker than both sorting it and um, doing it manually like this because we're using dictionaries and dictionaries are super fast. Okay, so what we do is that we say for letter in word one, if letter, if we've seen this letter, if we've, so if the letter is not in word one, and sorry, if the letter is not in count one, assuming it can spell count correctly. So we look at every letter. If we don't find that letter. So yeah, for every letter, if the letter is not in count one, 
then uh, then well, this is the first. So we look at every letter. If we haven't seen it before, we mark down that we've seen this letter now. Otherwise, we mark down that hey, we've seen this letter before. So let's go ahead and say we've seen it one uh one one more time. Similarly, we now do the same thing for word two. The uh, difference here is I need to make sure I put count ones over here and count twos over here. And then we just simply ask, and then we can just simply return count one equal equals count two. Dictionaries are pretty useful like that. They're useful for counting how many of the specific thing occurred. Um, if you're interested in seeing what other things uh, dictionaries can be used for, um, give me one second. So we've mainly been doing counting, but the other thing that they're used for is categorization. And one particular uh, wonderful use case of that is this program over here called Absurdal which for those of you who are familiar with Wordle, you're about to get trolled, be trolled very hard. Um, so uh, let, let's go ahead and start with that word, by the way, troll. Oh, it was all incorrect. Uh, any suggestions for the next word? Yes. Blaine? Uh, with... P-L-A-I-N? Okay. Um, and it's gonna mark it wrong, of course, because it's gonna, again, this is a troll. This is, this is not, notice that there's not a, uh, that there, there's not a number of, limit on the number of guesses. And to give you an idea of what's going on here, anyone, well, actually, any other guesses? Watch. What? Watch. Watch. If I hit give up on this, it will tell me a word. It will give me vivid. And then I can hit actually don't give up. And I can hit give up again and it will tell me dizzy. Yes. Something like that. It's actually a bit more complex going on underneath because what it's trying to do, because again, it's not a matter of just uh, doing that. It's a matter of like, if I do dizzy, it will tell me why over there because that's what it finds most advantageous for prolonging the game as long as possible. It's making a decision to prolong the game every step based on it. What it does is that basically it's got a, it's got a list of all the words in the English of the, all the five letter words in the English language. And what it does is that it plays your game your choice of your wordle choice on every single one of them every turn. Well, not every turn. What it does is it goes through all the, on the first term, it goes through all the ones over here. It checks every letter and it goes and categorizes them in a dictionary. Basically, okay, all the letters that would have all blanks, this is one category. All the letters that would reveal a T in the first position, that's another category. All the letters that, all the words that would have T but in the wrong place go in another category, you know? And so it splits it up into categories. And whatever's the largest category, that's the which happens to be in a lot of cases for the first few turns, getting no letters right, that's the one it goes with. Okay, they hit random guess coach, right? Until, so over here, it's just basic, again, going off of what my guesses are and it's using a dictionary to categorize these things. We do the same thing in us in data structures to make a version of Hangman that does the exact same principle where it just cheats and tries to prolong the game as long as possible. It's all based on the fact that basically there's a lot of words. Mummy, of course. Um, it, it, it is, um, you know, when I saw this, I'm like, I know this one. I give this one out as a homework only for Hangman, which, as you can see, the kind of principle here, but it uses a dictionary. The dictionary here is different though. The key, rather than counting, uh, you know, rather than the value being a count, the key is essentially an outcome. 
for that word, the outcome for, for, for a particular word. And the value is the list of all the words that have that particular outcome. And so it just kind of sorts them together. Um, it, it, it's, 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 like I said, uh, it, it's a, it's a troll of a program. Um, let's see, we've done this. Sum of tens, I think that's one we haven't done here. Let's see. And then there, let's see, sum of ten. So we'll do sum of tens. Okay. And then I'll try to find a regular expression one for us at the very end. Sum of tens. Given a list of uh, uh, that contains many integers, sorry, a list of lists. Sum up, go through all the all lists, and basically, I want for this one again. I just want to make sure that you knew how to uh, that if you're working with lists, I also want you to make sure you work with lists of lists. Given a list that contains uh, many lists. Of integers, return the sum of all the integers and list their multiples of 10. Range. Actually, I think rather than doing a regex problem, I'll use my last 10 minutes to show you one of my favorite features of the Python programming language without that, that, that you might be able to use from here. So for L in, sorry, for L list of nums in the numbers for n in list of numbers okay and some if n is divisible by 10, total plus equals zero, we haven't, sorry, total plus equals n. We haven't defined that value yet, so we'll go ahead and define it. And then, Return total. Now, okay. So that one's fairly straightforward. So let's talk about a couple things that I haven't gone over in Python because they're a bit on the heavier side, but honestly, I think they're really cool. Um, so let's go ahead and open up a new Python shell over here. Um, the first is the fact that everything is that Python, everything's an object. Um, so let me go ahead and write a function. Def uh, double x, which is a very simple function right over here. Double is just going to return twice x. You're wondering why in the world am I doing this? Because it's really cool and it could help you. And if I, and it, I feel it's my prerogative to let you know about this in the last 20 minutes we have. Return two times x. Okay. So you can just declare a function, whatever, just line by line. So we can double five comes to 10. Um, but what you may not know is that I can say something like this, uh, D is equal to double. Um, and then I can say D of five, and then it works. Again, everything is an object. If I type in double over here, it tells me it's a function called double. It's a, dump, it's a function object, same with D. It's now just alias there. So. You know, you can store functions and variables, which is useful because you can also write functions in one line, something called lambda calculus, lambda expressions. The idea here is that sometimes you need a function and you don't want to put all the effort into doing that. So for instance, I could do this same effective thing by doing, by doing something that looks weird, but I swear to God, it's not as hard as it looks. Lambda x is equal to lambda x to x, and there you go. At the function in one line that says, here I'm writing a func a lit a function literal, an anonymous function as it's called, an anonymous function, 
And it says, given an input, I'm going to multiply that input by two, just like we had earlier. Okay. Now, why in the world am I bothering going into this? Okay. So start at the beginning of the Python shell. Why am I bothering going into this? Because Python has one very useful built-in function that I love to death. It saves me a lot of times when I'm working with stuff, and it's called map. Map is a built-in function that says, and if we look at it, it says to say it, that it wants to take in two things. It's going to take in a function and a bunch of iterables. In other words, a string or a list, usually a list. Let's go ahead and create a list. Okay. List is equal to, um, so list over here. Let's say it's going to one line this list range zero to 101. So this is all the list of all numbers from one to 100. Go one to 101. All right. All the numbers from one to 100. Okay. All I did I took is I took that range and converted it into a list. Okay. Which you can do. No problem. So now, Suppose I had a list and I wanted to double everything in the list. You know, I wanted to take the same, I wanted to take this list, but I wanted everything instead of being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I wanted to be two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, all the way up to 200. Or some more arbitrary, more complicated function like squaring everything. I can say map. And then I can take in a function that does that task. And what, and what map does is as given a function, I'm going to apply it to everything, every list here. So uh, for example, if I did map and I took this and I gave it the string function, and then I take the outputting uh, the output object and turn it into a list. It converts everything in the list into a string. It doesn't convert the list. It doesn't convert the list into a string. It takes every individual item and converts each one to a string. That's pretty useful. Or if I wanted to go ahead and take a chance to double those things, again, a lambda x to let's let's square it this time. So give for every so a function that takes in an x and apply is x squared to that x. And we'll take in the same list. And now we get every number squared. One squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, five squared. We're fairly comfortable with our squares up to 100, everybody. Then then we never see them. And then nobody memorizes it past, you know, past 12, I think. So, but that's everything squared. And so the idea here is that you can write functions in one line. There's a lot of power there that happens uh, to be there. And it makes it extremely useful to basically say, hey, I've got a list or a string or something I need to iterate through and I wanna apply it to everything in this. Um, well, that took only five minutes. What else do we have? List, con yes. Does the double function work in there? Yes, it does. It's it, any, um, although, although double wouldn't work because I didn't write double. Are you referring to float? Oh, yes. If I wrote, sorry, I, I closed the terminal. So it's restarted. So double's gone now. But if I were to write a double function, let's go ahead and do that again. Def uh, double x return x yeah you could if you don't want to write a lambda expression guess what you don't have to you can just simply write a classic function and do and now instead of doing this we could type in the name of our function notice that we're not invoking it here because our function is being passed as a as a parameter we can do that this is actually kind of useful for your some of your more advanced calculus homework where you've got functions that have to call other functions. You know, you can write a function where you pass in a function and then it can call those functions for you. 
Kind of useful if you have to get into the math one. What else do we use? One of the early signifiers we can check to see if you're cheating early on is if I see you're using a lambda expression. The other thing I look for general on that kind of doesn't tell me you're cheating, but it makes me go, I need you to explain this, is something called a list comprehension. Um, so let's see, I for I in range 100. So that's basically one line create. Uh, so list comprehensions are pretty cool things. They allow you to create a lot, a list in just one line. Um, and I don't feel the need to go over them. I don't go over them a lot during the semester because of just how much they, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're already learning a lot is the point. There's no need to add these things that only, that are very Python specific. The iterating over for loops in general, that's not language specific. You know, these other skills are not language specific. But the syntax for Lambda and Map, that's fairly Python uh, specific. Other programming languages have the same paradigm, the same paradigms, the same functionalities, but they, they do it in different, you know, in completely different syntax. Um, but we can modify this. So here I've just got a four in range, you know, function, four I in range, whatever. But then I've got this I here, and we can play with what I is. I could do something like, again, I times two. You know, for all these things in this range, I want every item to be I times two. Gets even wilder. I believe this is the syntax. So this says, um, I want to, every item is I times two for every I in range from a hundred, so long as I mod two, so long as an I is not even. Sorry, so long as the I is even. So only double your even numbers, basically it's saying, and exclude anything else. There's a, the notice that, 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 that there's a lot of, you know, you can, this is not doing anything you can't do with a for loop and if statements and append statements, but it does this very quickly and very concisely. Um, do you need to know these things for the exam? Heck no. But I feel like this is the perfect opportunity to kind of bring up these, these tools that are built into Python. Um, you know, because you get a lot of different powerful, very powerful statements um, that you can do um, with these things. It's always valuable whenever you're picking up a new programming language to kind of look at the of what what are called the reserved words in Python. The words that have been already set or that already um, sorry, the words that basically we say that you cannot use, this is from Python 2. Let's go ahead and see. Um, they call them keywords. So keywords in Python. Keywords in Python. Python keyword. Here we go. There's a bunch of these different things. And it's always kind of useful to go through when you're, when you're playing with the new programming language or even languages you know, to check what, and where, what are these words that you can use. I mean, some of you have learned about the, the try and the accept clause. And some of you may have even seen the finally, which occurs uh, when, you, when that happens. Await class. Dell, some of you have learned. Assert is useful for testing. Of the ones that are built into Python, um, my personal favorite is yield, um, which is just such a weird function. And I cannot really explain it until I sh in, without showing it to you. Uh, yield is, but the yield is kind of the way that your range function works, kind of. So for uh, yield, test 
um, we're going to go ahead and type in a. So we're going to go ahead and do four in range 10. Yield I. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and run this code so that it compiles. And now I'm going to call or so that in so that it's all built in, not compiles, because this is an interpreted language, you know, but it's just a habit of calling these yield test. So I run yield test. It says yield, it generates an object. Yield test. Do I get to do it again? No. Nope. Changes it. Oh, right. Yield, print yield test. Nope, generator object, boo. Ah, haven't used it in like three years, so I've kind of forgotten about it, but it's a really cool feature with it. Let's just go ahead for in yield test. What it do, what yield does is that it temporarily it's kind of like return, but it returns every value that you're iterating over. Essentially, it allows you to kind of call something multiple times and then remember where you were when you called it. It's a, it is a very kind of wild thing that I, I I've always thought was really interesting. Um, to do. It, I would definitely look into it if you're interested in like um, in, in the way that different things in Python works. Like I said, I haven't had a chance to use it in a while, but it's really cool when it, you, you when when you want to use it, you really want to use it. Um, so what are you, so okay, three eleven. So now you're so this is essentially the end of the class. So now what are the next steps for everybody? Well, for those of you who are in uh, computer science, your next steps are taking uh, CIS 1060, uh, 1068, which is Java. Same if you're in IST or data science, 1068, which is the object-oriented programming, most likely taught by Professor Fiore. It's a very good course. It teaches you jo uh, Java, but he will retest you and make sure that you know all the material that came from, uh, from here, because while the structures may look different. You know, the specific syntax of Java may look different and it requires some weird black magic phrases to start, uh, to, you know, to run your program. It's the, the building blocks are the same. It's a lot more structured is the point. Um, for those of you who, you know, took this class, you know, because you were interested in programming, um, the next step is essentially up to you. You have a different couple of different options. You can decide to take more classes in this. Next step would be again 1068. Uh, it's not doesn't require too much to get a certificate or a minor in computer science or ISNT or data science. Well, data science requires a bit more. But with but for a certificate, if you enjoyed this class, I would urge you to do this. If you know you mildly tolerated this, then I hope I gave you the skills that uh are, you know, that can at least automate a lot of the drudgery that goes on with a lot of tasks that you have to do. Um, there's a lot of different, there's a ton of different, uh, in fact, and that's why I love this other textbook that I've linked to a couple times, the automate the boring stuff. It tells you how to work, it, it tells you how to set up Python scripts that how, that can automate a lot of the stuff that you can do in Excel. Never mind that Excel has its own like programming language built into it, you know, it excels its own beast or working with Google, but working with PDFs or Word documents. One of the things that I, I did, um, and, and I'll just leave you with an example. Uh, you know, one of my steps in learning Japanese is that I, I had a bunch of worksheets I needed to download. Okay. But each of those worksheets, but there were like a uh, hundred or so worksheets. And each of them were in a different URL. So if I had to, 
do this, then what I would need to do is I would need to go through and, uh, you know, I'd have to go through and manually click on every PDF and download it, you know? That would be, and that that's extremely tedious, all right? Let's see if I've, I'm, I'm looking for a semester where I've done this. Ah, oh, yes. Now I've done this here. I'd have to go through and I'd have to download each one of these uh, PDFs to teach me Japanese one at a time. But the URLs were actually fairly consistent, which lets you do some things like write a script that, um, Let's see that given, you know, given a script, I can download all the files and then merge them into one file. And now instead of having to download a hundred separate files, I've got one file to print out rather than a hundred separate files. It, 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 these kind of things make it really, oh, there it is. So this particular, and, and it took me oh, about 20, uh, 20 seconds to write two programs that that did this. Uh, the first one just simply given a, UR, a base URL, downloaded all these URLs, saved them, and I and and that and this script saved me like you know 15 minutes worth of just clicking uh, of drudgery clicking on stuff, and then probably five more minutes of double checking that I downloaded things and didn't double overwrite things. And rather than you know printing a hundred separate files, this simply took all the PDF files, put them into one file, and it worked. This is the kind of thing that you can do that you know can save you a lot of time. So overall, I, I so anyway, overall, I hope you enjoyed this class. I'm uh if you have any questions, of course, in the future, you know, I'm still available, even though you, I might not be your active professor anymore. And uh, you can hang around on the Discord for as long as you like. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't kick out students from the Discord from one semester to the other. It makes it too complicated. So if you want to stick around and ask programming questions that, that you might have, you know, I do that occasionally. So, okay. I'll get these things uploaded to you as soon as possible.